Welcome, everyone. Um, I appreciate last talk of the day, so thank you very much. Uh, glad you're all here. I was going to start having to try and throw stickers on the floor to tempt people in, but now that you're all here, I'm not going to give them out. Only joking. You've got stickers at the end if you want to. OK, so I'm going to talk about password making and breaking. Probably a little bit more breaking than making, but um, yeah. So a little bit about me, first of all. I'm Will. I um, co-founded Indot Security a um, little over a year ago now. Um, I've done cyber stuff for a, a good while. I've spent the last five, six years um, hacking. Uh, prior to that, I spent probably about the same amount of time doing digital forensics, um, criminal investigations. I've been very lucky to have trained at some pretty cool places. And if you want to find me online, I am Stealthloit. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I'm going to do a bit on traditional sort of common techniques, but it's more of a, a recap, just for anyone who's never done any sort of password breaking before. I'm going to focus probably on the, the more passphrase and creative stuff a little bit later on. I'm um, going to have a look at some guidelines, how they've changed over time. Um, and then I'm going to do a couple of examples. Um, so some hardware limitation and stuff, using a crypto wallet as an example. And then I'm going to get some foreign character cracking and wrapping up with a little bit of secure advice. Before we get into it, um, we're going to get into discussing offline password attacks only. So I'm not going to be talking about attacking remote web services, online brute forcing. That's not the remit of this. We're all about attacking hashes offline in this talk. Um, and as some of you, anyone used Hashcat before? Fantastic tool. Certainly, uh, certainly my, uh, my favorite tool of choice. Um, this is what I'm going to be focusing on when we're looking at syntax and techniques. So. Common techniques. So traditionally, if any of you have done cracking before, I suppose the go-to the go-to technique is um, rules, rules and dictionaries. Um, many of you might have heard of a common rule set like uh, rockyou.txt. There's 101 million rules out there that you can use. Typically means, of course, you take your, your password candidate from your dictionary, you hash it, you compare it to the stolen hash. Optionally, you can add rules, and if the hatch is mash, success. We're going to have a, just a single example of some of these as well, just in case you haven't seen them before. Mask and hybrid attacks, we'll discuss in a second. Rainbow tables, some of you may have heard of rainbow tables. Slowly being phased, I say phased out, the wrong phrase there, but um, becoming less useful now over time. And then, of course, there's an actual pure brute force exhausting an entire key space, which again is, is kind of, these last two are kind of hardly used these days. Regardless of the technique you deploy, you employ, Success is going to base on a number of things, but these are, the, these are the main areas here. So the algorithm complexity. So for example, attacking a Windows hash, NTLM, is going to be substantially faster and easier than attacking a very computationally um, strong and complex hash, for example, bcrypt, scrypt, things like that. The length and complexity of the password itself, of course, it goes without saying. These two contribute to the overall key space, okay, exhausting the possible combinations. Whether you have any known or predictable elements, okay? So these are very, very important. If there's anything you know about the password, you know it can only be constructed using lowercase letters or numbers. We can remove characters we don't need from our attack to therefore reduce our key space. And of course, the hardware. Nowadays, it's all about GPUs. I don't know if we've got any gamers in the house, but all the latest and greatest NVIDIA gaming graphics cards, stack a load of these up, and you can crack hashes very, very quickly, as we'll see. So I'm just going to cover, I think, just two slides on some of the common stuff, and then I want to kind of move on um, beyond that. So an example here for a dictionary attack using rules. Okay? What we can do is we can call Hashcat. In this case, we need to give it a mode. Well, in every case, we need to give Hashcat a mode. Mode 1000 is NTLM. So, okay, so Windows login here, okay, Windows password hashes. Give it a file in this case, hashes.txt. We're going to give it rock as a dictionary as an example, and I'm going to give it some rules. And in this case, I've got a, a rule shown there, one rule to rule them all. A mask attack, OK? Again, we call Hashcat. In this case, we're attacking an MD5 hash, mode 0. A3, there's a, the next slide will show you what the uh, attack modes are, but A3 is a brute force attack. And in this particular case, we have to create custom character sets. So what you can see here is Hashcat by default supports here four different custom character sets. And you can see the inbuilt character sets and their single letter notations. So a lowercase l is any lowercase alpha character. Uppercase for you, D for decimal, we have some hex there. S for special, and quite, quite useful, A, which is basically mixed alphanumeric and symbol. So all upper lowercase numbers and special characters. Here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to guess this number of um, 
positions in the key space. So we have two, four, six, eight, nine. I think there is positions there, nine number ones. And for every position in number one, it's going to look here, and number one, it's going to test for lowercase and for decimal. So that would be testing every possible lowercase and decimal character in that key space. I'm not going to sort of point you to any specific place for word lists. This is a nice repository that has loads of them. There's no one word list to suit anyone. There are lots out there. Rock is quite a common one. It's, it's about 135 meg. It's, I think it's got about 15 million passwords in. There are substantially bigger ones. I mean, I've got dictionaries that are sort of over 70 gigs in size. They're, it depends on what you're using, the attack you're carrying out, and there's other factors involved. Now, Hashcat itself has a number of very good inbuilt rules. Um, some are more efficient than others. It depends on what hash you're cracking and how you're, you know, how you're approaching it. Um, bit of shameless plugging from me here. Um, when I was working for my former employer, um, I did some research um, on a number of inbuilt Hashcat rules and some uh, non-default Hashcat rules, and I ran it over a large data set. It was over the, um, the, the game Minecraft. One of the forums got hacked a while ago, and the data was, was leaked. Um, and I used um, that as a test bed, so lots of unsalted MD5 hashes, which is good for some research there. And I ran several tests using a lot of the inbuilt Hashcat rules, and I extracted basically the best performing rules from a number of tests and combined them to make this rule. It's by no means the best rule out there, um, but when you're dumping Active Directory on pen tests on client engagements, um, it certainly helped me crack more hashes than some, some of the um, inbuilt ones by themselves. So a link if you want to use it. On to a hybrid, OK? So again, the dash A3 from before relates to here brute force. Again, for a hybrid attack, we're going to attack MD5 in this example. Whatever hashes are in hashes.txt. And we have two types of hybrid attack. We have a word list and a mask, or a mask and a word list, as shown there uh, on the right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to tell Hashcat, take every uh, entry in the ROCQ dictionary, use that as a password candidate, and then fuzz three decimal characters afterwards. So you know, if you've forgotten your password, I can't remember what it was, but I think it ended in three characters, or you're not quite sure, but you, you kind of know that three character element. A hybrid attack might be useful. And a pure brute force, as you can see here, it's just one example. The A character, so jumping back to where you were before, the A is all upper, lower, decimal, and special. Dash dash increment, OK? So in this case, increment means start at the first position and build up and up and up. Without that, Hashcat will attack the fixed length of, in this case, A's I've given it. But increment will, will ensure you exhaust the entire key space. Now, that will likely never finish, and we're going to look at actual, actual sort of times that would be required to brute force a key space soon. You'll see why. Now, rainbow tables, yeah, they're, they're kind of rarely situationally useful these days. A rainbow table is a, a list of pre-computed hashes with their clear text. So it saves the step of hashing your clear text candidate before you compare it to your stolen hash. The problem with rainbow tables is they're, first of all, a huge storage requirement. So there are several sites out there. If you Google free rainbow tables, you can probably download um, LM, NTLM. You can get MySQL. You can get some SHA variants. Uh, but they only kind of got to kind of nine or 10 characters for free. And even then, we're talking terabytes of storage space when you actually start building it up. So the second you have a password that's longer than, let's say, 10 characters, it, you're not going to crack it anyway. Um, I'm not going to say there aren't better resources or you know, paid services that will give you good rainbow tables. They are quicker, um, but we typically don't find they're used um, in the field these days. So key space. Key space, the math isn't too hard behind working out key space. So the key space is working out every possible combination before you are 100% guaranteed to crack your password. The key space is the number of available characters we have, the character set, to the power of the length. On the right here, you'll see we have the 95 printable ASCII characters. Okay? So there's, um, there's many more. There's extended ASCII tables, which go beyond this. But these are the 95 printable ASCII characters. And that accounts for our mixed alphanumeric and our special um, character sets. So when we're attacking passwords, we kind of assume we're attacking the, the entire key space. So in this example, if you have a nine-character password using the full key set, or a 10-character password but dropping the specials, which do you think is stronger? By a show of hands, who thinks nine-character password is stronger? Bigger key space. Uh, the nine-character with, yeah, with a complete all 95 principal characters. One. So probably, possibly two. And the rest of you, I imagine, is 10. OK, so the answer is actually 10. 95 to the power nine. They're both huge numbers. This is 839 quadrillion, I think that is. It's a huge number. Um, <laughs> nothing that's going to be probably, you know, brute force in your lifetime, but <laughs> just goes to show the length over complexity. And we're going to look at the length a bit more when we talk about guidelines. So this is where I'm in my element. 
I get very excited about password cracking, and I'm a huge password cracking fanatic. So when it comes to cracking at great speeds, I get really excited, if you haven't guessed already. Um, this guy, um, EPIX OIP, Jeremy Gosney, um, JM Gosney on Twitter, really, really big player in the uh, password cracking field, works on Hashcap. He's got this gist, um, and he has a lot of uh, benchmarks, and he gets like eight, he gets eight graphics cards, and he does a Hashcap benchmark, and he puts it through the paces. And you know, when he, when he posts something, I'm like, oh, great, fantastic, new Hashcat stats, because that's the sad life I live. Um, and if you take eight of the uh, GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition cards, stock cards, I think they were, um, cracking, so Windows passwords at 513 giga hashes. So a giga hash is one billion hashes a second. So that's 513 billion guesses per second. Not slow by any stretch of the imagination. And we're attacking the full 95 character set. Now, these are, of course, kind of rough numbers. You can see how, when we're talking about raw brute forcing, exhausting a key space, the, the, the graph does that very, very quickly. Okay, so. Again, <laughs> now these are a, a okay, these are kind of estimates based on Hashcat um, benchmarks, and the benchmarks themselves are simulating, you know, ideal scenarios. But you can quickly see how improbable it is, how unlikely it's going to be to crack 10 characters onwards. Also useful to note that on average, you probably wouldn't take, probably wouldn't take 3.7 years to crack a 10 character password because that would mean you'd have had to have guessed every other combination and got it wrong. You're you're very very likely to crack it before that. These are of complete times. Also, um, Hashcat, like I'm sure many other tools, by default employs what's called Markov modeling, which bases the probability of a character on its position and what, it's preceded, or what, what was preceded. So it can guess quite well what's likely to be cracked, um, and it will help you in your, in your quest. Useful to know for any uh, graphics card gaming enthusiasts that the newer 28 FE cards, as reported by Jeremy, are approximately 20% slower than the 1080 Ti's. So it's not just you know, spend thousands of dollars on eight of the newest card, and you're the fastest, car fastest person in the world. Um, but again, it's you know, it's it's a, uh, it's ongoing. <laughs> Guidelines. Okay, so has anyone come across NIST before, National Institute of Standards and Technology? So they've put out guidelines for a while now. Um, I think it was back in 2003 was the kind of the revision where this kind of stuff over here came out, and in 2017 it was revised. Now this has been heavily condensed. There's there were, of course, lots of very good guidelines, but I'm willing to bet that most people, you know, who have worked in a network, in a domain environment, you've been told to use complex passwords, minimum of eight characters, and you've had to rotate your passwords every three months, and you're not allowed to choose one of your six previous passwords. Now, as you're all humans, I'm imagining a lot of you are quite predictable, and what do we do when we can't use the last six? We had a one, then a two, then a three, and when we get to six, what do we do? We go back to one again, or we have an exclamation mark because who wants to remember completely random, unique passwords? You're going to forget. So, right, that's the first part. 2017, newer guidelines came out, which recommend that you should support up to 64 characters, but still a minimum of eight, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, <laughs> complexity is recommended, but not required, okay? This is all about the length over complexity. You should never truncate passwords. Oh my God, how many of you have gone to a website, you've created an account, you've put in a username, you've generated your one password, last pass, what was it, 70 character password, you've pasted it in, your password account is there, it's fantastic, you go to log in, invalid password, what? And then you realize it's been silently truncated to like 20 characters or something, it's, it's a massive, massive pain. So no password should be truncated, password hints should be gone, okay? Anything that uses knowledge-based authentication, don't use your mother's maiden name. People can find out the first school you went to, the first car you drove, okay? We should be getting rid of all this, as per NIST guidelines. <laughs> I'm sure people have their own opinions. No expiry without justification. So, unless you've kind of got reason to believe that there's been a data breach, an account's been compromised, you shouldn't really be expiring passwords regularly because it, it kind of conditions us as users to choosing weak passwords. Knowing how we choose passwords, it's not gonna make us choose any better passwords. And compared to known dictionaries, if we can have systems whereby there are some, kind, there are some um, solutions to this already, um, whereby you can check and if a user submits their password, you know, it, it's been caught in a previous breach, you probably want to use a different password. These are all good things moving forwards to help secure us. But yeah, we're moving to a place where passphrases over passwords is, is where we should be. Has anyone seen this, uh, this XKCD comic before? Yeah, a few lots. Like, yeah, I've seen this before. So around mid-2017, mid when um, NIST pushed out their guidelines, this was flying around on every site I saw. And, and it, it kind of, it targets um, uh, 
online, online attacks, so sort of weak remote web services, but the underlying principle still applies for offline. The, the, what it comes down to is, is here, through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess, because we've all been told to create passwords that kind of look like that. And, you know, it is what it is. I don't know about you, but correct horse battery staple. You'd be surprised the number of people who, after seeing this, have actually used that as their password. Okay? And those words do appear in dictionaries. So, um, but yeah, however you want to take it, we should be looking at four random common words. Okay? Now, when we're talking about common words, we now need to look about moving away from traditional techniques, the kind of dictionary things which don't have these random common words, and seeing if we can start looking to attack passphrases. So, combinator attacks. This, this is nothing kind of, in terms of attack, there's nothing new. This has been in, in Hashcat-like, other, like other modes for a long, long time. But um, highly recommend um, you follow Netmux uh, online. Big, big player in the field. Again, he's got a fantastic blog about cracking um, long passwords. Just some example word lists. Google top 10,000 or 20,000 words. Very, very good for this kind of thing. And we're going to look at an example, just one example, um, of how we can kind of build these word lists up to attack passphrases. The first example, though, is at the bottom here. So again, we're going to call up Hashcat, attack some MD5 hashes. A1, so attack mode 1, if you remember back to an earlier slide, is the combinator attack. And the combinator attack takes two dictionaries together and basically guesses each entry combined with every other entry. So it just, it just matches two dictionaries and guesses all possible combinations from both two dictionaries. Okay? So pass it two dictionaries if you're choosing. I'm going to use 20k and I'm going to create more files in these examples that build on 20k on this original one. But of course it would be whatever password um, list you're using. So there is a file, um, there's a, a useful program I should say, in the Hashcat utils package. It doesn't come with Hashcat, download it separately. But it's got a ton of really, really good stuff. We're going to look at another one a bit later on. Called Combinator. You invoke Combinator, point it to two dictionaries, output a new file. And looking at the top five entries of what you'd get, um, you can see what it's done. It's taken uh, the two dictionaries and started joining them together. Now, it'll take, there'll be, um, it'll start with the first word in the dictionary, which is the, and it will take, in this case, 20,000 of the other words and bolt it to the, and then it will go to the second word in the first dictionary, so on and so forth, and you can see. Now, 20,000 squared is 400 million, so that's going to produce quite a big file. So if this is a 100 kilobytes in size, I think the 20K combined dictionary is about 5 gigs in size. Not out of the realms of possibility, but when you start building these up, your dictionaries are going to grow in size. You can see what we've done here, hopefully. <laughs> Building this on to attack three or four words together is, is kind of an easy step for us. We can just use, again, our combinator attack, but use our combined dictionary together. Or, if you want to attack three words, our combined dictionary with the original dictionary shown there. And you can see what it's doing. It's bolting them together. Now, in this particular case, when we start expanding the 20K word list out, the key space is actually huge, and um, it, it's probably not plausible to exhaust every combination in both these, at least on not the hardware that I'm using, but I don't know what super botnet GPU rigs you guys have all hacked and are running in the background, so I'll, I'll leave that to the imagination. But in that example, you might have known that what if you put spaces, pass phrases over pass words? It's a very valid point, and some people, you know, they might have... I want to say a memorable phrase or a memorable sentence, but that would go against NIST guidelines of not using, of not using random words. Your passphrases should be random, really. How do, we, how do we attack this? OK, let's start adding delimiters into our dictionaries. So in the first example, we've still got our original 20k txt file here. And we're just going to add a space at the end. I mean, you could do this 101 ways. This is just the example I've used with ORC. Add a space at the end of your dictionary. And I'm going to create a new dictionary called 20k space in this case. Here's the first two lines of that dictionary, and because you can't see it, we've printed the length of those first two lines just to show you there is a space after the respective words. What we can then do is we can use Combinator to combine our space dictionary with the original again. And it won't take, you know, it's not rocket science to see what we're going to get. We're going to get two words with a space delimiter. Now, if you wanted to run that dictionary in Hashcat as a standard dictionary attack, you could, and you would, of course, test those two words. But we can, of course, build this up. Now, the combinator attack itself has, has a couple of rules that are specific, and they're denoted by dash J and dash K. Um, we're going we're gonna to sort of cover how to get more rules than just this in a second, but the combinator itself has this, uh, have, the, have these attack modes. Single rule applies to each word from either the left or the right word list. So what we can do 
is we can take our 20k combined mid space dictionary that we've just created. We can then do dash j and dollar space is actually going to add a space, then put our final dictionary on the end. Okay? So the dash j, we're applying a space to our left word list. So our first dictionary is going to take us to here. We're then adding the space here and finally appending our final dictionary across. One simple, one simple added rule, we now have three words. Again, substitute that for the same dictionary twice, you've now got four words. Again, though, these are quite big dictionaries now, and it, it's, unless you've got tons and tons of GPUs, <laughs> it is going to take a while to do, but you know, it's the best effort depending on what you're cracking, how long you've got to crack it, what resources you have available to you. So, combinator, all the rules. Dash J and dash K is great, but what if you want to use your inbuilt hashcat rules? There are, some, there are some good ones in there that actually do what, hash, what the rules were designed to do. Add a 1, add a 1, 2, a 1, 2, 3, substitute an O for a 0, substitute an E for a 3, do all the things that we as humans have been told to make our passwords stronger for so long. Well, fortunately for us, Hashcat and all their utils, are pipe, they're, they're pipeable, they're all sort of pipelineable, and it's great because you can bolster various things together, and we're going to look at a bigger, more complex attack later. Let's add another space. In this case now, you can add any delimiter, hyphen, colon, comma, whatever you want. In this case, we're going to use a space. Add a space to your pre where, where the dictionary we left off at, and I've tried to make the wording as easy as possible, but I've called mine my combined dictionary with a mid and an end space. <laughs> you can see again, we now have length eight for that, uh, that top entry. Then what we can do is we can call Combinator up, take our mid-end space with our mid-space. So if you think about what we've done, the mid-end space is going to leave us a space here, and then our second set of two words is only going to have a space in the middle. So we're going to ensure we don't have a trailing space at the very end. We're going to output that, pipe that into Hashcat, mode, whatever you're cracking, and then you can invoke whatever rules you want to do any rule within Hashcat. And then that will take that, and then, of course, depending on your rule set, will then mangle your candidates accordingly. The dash W4 stuck on the end here is the workload profile. So by default, Hashcat runs at a certain, uh, certain workload profile, um, at dash 2, I think it is. If you go to dash 3, your system will get a bit hotter. You'll lose a little bit more, use a little bit more juice out of your laptop. Um, your desktop will become a little bit less responsive, but still usable. And dash 4, I think they call it headless or insane. Um, in fact, you know what? Let's have a look. Uh, put it in the background here somewhere. It's near the uh, near the bottom. Nightmare. How consumption insane. See, there's got to like a specific part of me that wants to do that anyway, just because of the wording, you know, anything that looks that good. But um, yeah. So it's one of those things. If you're running this on Ubuntu, headless OS, you don't need GUI responsiveness, you can up the workload profile. Just know you need to need some cooling. Hopefully, you've all got air-conditioned password cracking rigs. <laughs> and the other thing to note is optimized kernels. Now, a lot of great, great work has been done on Hashcat in the past, and this has been out for a while. But this will allow you to drastically increase the speed at which you crack passwords. But unfortunately, the limitation is it'll, um, it'll um, decrease length. So Hashcat, I think, supports up to 256 characters for, for most, most things now, bar some specific algorithm-specific exceptions. However, if you do dash O, you'll get ridiculously faster speeds on any hardware you're using. Um, however, just two examples, Windows limited 27, MD5 limited 31. So if you're cracking a 28-character password, you might be out of luck here. You might have to sacrifice the speed for the sake of the extended ability to crack passwords at length. Just something to be aware of. OK, expander. So this is the first part of the Hashcat utils. Expander's quite cool. It's not an attack mode. It's a password candidate generator. And kind of what we've done here is, by default, I'm giving you both examples here. By default, this will um, it's set to length max 4. What we recommend is, I say we, the password cracking community recommends, um, all the cool guys at the Hashcat team. So you should um, recompile with length 8 to give you much better results. Beyond that, the dictionary sizes get a bit big. But if we just give, we're just giving it the word Hashcat in this case. We take echoing Hashcat out to expander, always unique your output because it will produce duplicates. And you can see it's going to go through your word list, every candidate, and chunk it up and give you little different permutations, different mutations of it. Now, this forms part of the fingerprint attack, which we're looking at next. So it's really good to get an idea in your mind of what this is doing now. OK, the fingerprint attack, one of the many uh, attacks that are very underused and should be used more. Now, this technically can be used without any word list whatsoever. 
I've got a video demo where we're going we're gonna to brute force our own word list. But you can start off, what was recommended you start off, is you start off with your Hashcat pot file. Now, your pot file is where Hashcat stores all your previously cracked hashes. So take all your previously cracked passwords. We're going to cut out the second field, which is the clear text passwords. Okay? We want the clear text passwords of all your previous domain compromises, okay? all of your previous victims. We're going to take their clear text passwords. You're going to expand them, unique them, and create a word list out of them. All right? We're then going to run that word list in combination with itself. So A1 combo attack with word list, word list. The dash dash remove in this case is optional, but as you crack your hashes, the remove will remove hashes as you crack them, so you don't have to rescan them next time effectively, making your hash list smaller each time. We're going to create an output file here called word list 2. Repeat and rinse. Take your newly cracked hashes, expand them, unique them, create a third word list. Run the third word list in combo with itself. Output word list 4. This exact, this exact rotation here is what's going to be um, on the demo shortly, and you'll see, and I've got some stats to show you how, it, how kind of effective it really is. We're then going to move on to prints, probability infinite chained elements. So this is created by um, Jens Stube, our Atom, at Hashcat, one of the main players there. Um, this takes a single dictionary input, and this chains words together. So this will go through your rock, your dictionary, whatever you want, and at random pick words, uh, and conform to a length that you specify. So let's say we do invoke Prince processor on rock U with a minimum password length of eight. We say eight because we assume you've brute forced everything seven and below anyway, because it's trivial to do. It will create every, it'll, it'll go through um, your rock U dictionary and pick out chains. So it'll do, it'll do a five letter and a three letter, a two, a two, a two, and a two. We've got four on the slide here, and this is taken directly from the uh, Prince processor uh, page, because it's easy to kind of see. If you were outputting four letter words, these were the combinations. If you wanted to, you could extend that. We don't have that in the, the video, but you can, you can um, mod modify what are called the element counts, so elements count min and max, and you can say, hey, I want to create password length of eight, but with a minimum element count of three. So that you'll only get three chained words or more together. So it's very customizable depending on what you want to do. Always deduplicate your dictionaries before running prints. Okay, so caveat here, in the video, Rock, the Rock U dictionary that I'm using has not been deduped first. Um, however, in spite of that, it's still consistent through the test that I'm showing you. So it, it, it doesn't really um, hold much bearing in this case. But this will be the syntax. Invoke Prince Processor. Give it your dictionary. We're going to give it a minimum password length of eight. Pipe it to Hashcat with your mode and your hashes. And off it will go. OK? Jeremy again, JM Gosney, decided uh, to Prinception. Because why not pipe Prince into Prince? We're already getting these randomly select selected elements. Why not feed that back into itself? Because why not? And see how it works. And as far as I've heard from other people in the community and stuff, it, it's really pretty good and it works well. <laughs> so you can see, again, just piping prints back into itself, then into Hashcat. And in this particular case, we're actually using dash G, which is self-generated rules. So if you don't have a rule set, you can say to Hashcat, generate your own completely random rules. And anything from like 100,000 up to I've seen people go up to a million. Of course, the more you give it, the longer it'll take. But, but hey, why not? Let's make this probability a bit more, this um, uh, password guessing a bit more non-deterministic, a bit more random. We, these are the types of attacks now that traditional kind of rules and dictionaries won't get as much. So we're moving on to, this is the more kind of advanced stuff where you've exhausted your favorite dictionaries and there are still some really critical hashes, just a couple of domain admins you, you, know, you don't have. This is where, you know, of course I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but these are the type of tax you now want to be looking at. In terms of the element chains, this will just bolt them together without any delimiters. There is an open request. Uh, I think it's actually been there a year or two now. I'm not sure if it's being worked on or not, or whether it's feasible or not. But, um, but hey, yeah, it would, be a, it, would be a, it would be a great step. But bottom line, literally, the bottom line on this slide, if dictionary and your combo attacks fail, look towards using Prince Processor, because it is a fantastic resource. And Purple Rain. OK, so this is, again, massive shout out to Netmux. There's some really, really good reading on the blog. Highly recommend you look for this. This builds on the Prince attack, but shuffles your word list. Because what he found was, if you take the Prince processor, and we're going to use Rock you again, just looking at the top eight entries of what you get, there you're eight. But if you shuffle it first, you get completely different results. And you could shuffle it, and you could shuffle and look at the last eight. And each time you do it, you'll get different results. And because you're getting different results, you're going to get different candidates generated. This is fantastic. OK, we're going to look at all of these attacks now. Um, you have to bear with me. The video is embedded in. Right, I'm going to try and do my best to stop this where possible. There are certain parts of the video that have been sped up. I'm just going to remove my pot file first at the top, just so we're starting with a clean slate. There are no previously cracked hashes here. 
And oh, it's yes, very useful to know. So the data set I'm using is Last.fm, a uh, UK uh, music streaming site that was set up in the early 2000s. They suffered a breach in 2012. The data was leaked 2016. So I used this data set. It was 43, around 43 million MD5 unsalted hashes. I took the top 500,000 from that. Um, and Hashcat will dedupe this. We're going we're gonna to start with less because of duplicate hashes. But this is going to be the data set used for, for all of these tests here. OK, first attack is going to be a straight rock queue, and I'm using my one rule. OK, optimized, and I'm going to remove hashes from the resulting file. That's all we're doing so far. This will finish quite quickly. OK, and we can see here in 1 minute 37 seconds it finished, and it's cracked 80% off the bat, 290,000. OK, running at uh, just over 8 billion guesses per second. OK, so we've already wiped out a load. That's, that's a good start. <laughs> Obviously, that's a very good start. Right, we've now got 68,000 left. We're going to start now building on some of these more advanced attacks. So, I mentioned in the fingerprint attack uh, you don't need to use a word list, and I'm not going to use a word list. I'm going to create my own word list by brute forcing my last FM hashes with a five character mixed alphanumeric with special. So, as you can see here, I'm not passing rock you. I'm giving it my file, A3 brute force, and I've got five letter A. And if you remember back to the, the inbuilt command, A is upper, lower, um, decimal, and special characters. And I'm going to create a word list just by looking for five character passwords inside, um, inside here. So I'm not using anything pre-existing, so to speak. OK, that will finish, and you'll see it cracked 52. Just, just 52 passwords. OK, so that, that's going to that's form the basis of what we now use in the fingerprint attack. And you can see some of the, oh, and you can see if I wasn't screwing up the video, um, some of those passwords that it cracked there. There we go. Some five character clear text there at the end after the colon. OK, so here's our first um, uh, expander. We're going to look at the clear text from our word.list, expand them, unique them, and create a dictionary called wordlist2. We're then going to run our first fingerprint attack on this. And there'll be, a, there'll, be a, there'll be a few of these, so you're going to see it's going to be a bit kind of repetitive. But if you just bear in mind, back to that slide, what we're doing, and I'll happily, you know, go over this again at the end if, if people need be. We're going to take our hash list. We're going to remove everything that we crack. We're going to run a combo attack of wordlist2 with itself, with wordlist2. We're going to output to create a new file called wordlist3. That's what we're doing here. And it's going to go through. And I've tried wherever possible to speed up videos. That one finished quite quickly. And it's now cracked 615. And now we begin the process, repeat and rinse. Oh. So this is self-perpetuating. And until you start seeing diminishing returns, uh, your word list is going to grow in size. So you can, you can do this, and you can automate this as well. You can just, it'll keep growing and growing until you stop cracking hashes. <laughs> well, say stop, until you start seeing diminishing returns. We're going to take our word list three, expand it, sort it, and create word list four. We're going to now run word list four in a combo attack with itself. And if you think about what Expander's doing each time, it's slicing up every word um, in combination with itself. We've now cracked, uh, oh, sorry, no, it's just the start of it there. <laughs> OK, that's now finished, 2 minutes 45 seconds, and we've cracked 9,000, just over 9,000 passwords. So you can see how this is now building up. And this is all stuff that the Rock queue um, with the rules didn't get. We're now going to take, again, repeat and rinse, expand the profile, run word list 6 in combo with itself to create word list 7. Do know the video is going at quite some pace here. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> That's going to go through. And at the end, we've cracked a further 5,860 there. There is an end to this, I promise. We're then going to create wordlist 8 with the output of wordlist 7 after expanding. Repeat the fingerprint attack again. And we are going to start to see some diminishing returns here. 805, okay, so now we're, we're dropping now. Wordless 9, expand to make 10, run 10 in a combo attack with itself. Mm -hmm. 
and exhausts pretty quickly now. Only 84 recovered. But we're going to go to the bitter end because, you know, hackers don't do things by halves. And I think there's going to be one more. Where we, I think we get nine. Yeah, nine recovered passwords here now. And then we're going to take our final passwords. I mean, at, at this point, you might be too lazy to carry on. Depend, you know, it depends on what you, if you've got. If you've got crucial hashes, privileged hashes, what you need for further, then you might, not, you might not need to go this far. And you know what? That's fine. But we're just going to show you how it starts and stops. And there we are. So we've done a number of attacks now, but we've cracked several thousand more additional passwords that uh, the original um, rule set and um, dictionary didn't give us. So now I'm just going to pause that for a second. First of all, you're witnessing my really bad video editing. There was stuff on the screen that shouldn't have been there, so I've blocked it out. <laughs> Prince. We're going to call Prince. We're going to give it Rock you. Password length 8 minimum. Pipe that to Hashcat. And we're going to start this just by itself, Prince by itself. OK, only 82 recovered. We're going to build on this, though. We're going to pass Prince one of its own optimized rules. So Prince Processor. Prince Processor comes with its own optimized rule set. Uh, it comes with two rules, actually. Um, but it's really good. And you can see straight away. And some of the crap passwords have got spaces in them as well. Prince is going through. And I'm going to run all these for two hour sprints. So we've got a few here. And of course, I've, I've zoomed the video up. Typically, with Prince and Purple Rain and stuff, ideally, you want to be running for kind of 12 to 24 hours at a time. Um, but 3,000 here. And now, finally, if I can get there in time, Purple Rain. Shuffling the rock queue, and because we've shuffled it, we're going to get different candidates. Again, pipe that into Prince, pipe that into Hashcat, and why not? Let's generate 300,000 self-generated Hashcat rules. Purple Rain is a fully non-deterministic out probability. You run this for 12 hours, Control C, start again. Run it for 12 hours, Control C, start again. You will generate different password candidates. These are designed for infinite runtime. Okay, they're fantastic ways of doing it. It's only your like patience, tolerance, and electricity bill that are the factors. Another 4,000. I'm going to let this run now because I'm conscious of time. I'm going to run the same thing. I'm literally going to repeat it. Shuffle the word list. Another 300,000. And I think there's one more just to wrap up. And there's a stat slide after this showing you, um, in this particular instance from this example, uh, what the kind of stats were. But this tracks passwords, like I said, that the dictionaries and rules just, just won't get. Um, it's really, really good. And finally, I'm just using my previous rule, one rule to rule them all pushing it in, shuffled wordless again, so purple rain with my own rule set. And it cracked a further 7,000. So it just goes to show, you know, don't give up, OK? Don't give up on your, on your hash cracks. This is where we started, OK? Bear in mind, the uh, cracked here um, is the percentage of remaining hashes. Now, I didn't put the remaining column in here, but for every time we take this number of hashes off, that's, of course, a percentage of the, the previous amount, so just bear that in mind. But you can see here, we started at 500,000. Hashcat deduped that from the start. So we actually only started off with that many unique hashes, but that's still 358,000 hashes. And when you take away all of this, I think you end up with around about 35, 36,000. Um, but it just goes to show, and these were only two hour runs. You know, if I was going at this hard, if I'm being determined, um, if, it, if, it's a, if it's a client who you know, wants to pay for it, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna get a much more determined attack. But um, yeah, use, use Prince, use Purple Rain. OK, crypto, just one example. Um, I did some work on this um, a year or, so, um, year or two ago. Just, just picked Ethereum wallets. Um, so my Ether wallet is the example here. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, 2018, uh, where it's actually says at the bottom, you probably can't see. Create your JSON key store file here. Um, nowadays, it does give you a good recommend. This is not a recommended way of doing it. You shouldn't really use a password. It's, it's not the best way. Either way, in this case, our, Ethere our Ethereum wallets, your password's protected using S-Crypt, okay, which is hashcat mode 15,700. This is where we come up to the GPU, CPU. So I'm going to start it here. GPU cracking depends on a couple of S-Crypt parameters, which when you deconstruct your um, JSON file that you download from your wallet, look kind of like this. And this is just an excerpt from a post I did a, a while back. So N, R, and P are here. Okay, so N and R, these two values, what is important. We're going to need these three strings, as shown in the hash cal accepted format, but the viability of our hardware is going to be dependent on these S script parameters. So there's a couple of things we have to do. The first thing we have to do is we have to work out how much RAM your GPU needs to use to make a single computation. 
we then need to work out how much RAM your GPU needs to spawn parallel computation, so enough computations to, to utilize the GPU. With these two together, we can work out the overall RAM requirement per GPU. Now, yeah, it gets a bit, a bit, a bit trickier, but the threads, comp threads per compute unit depend on the architecture. So a um, NVIDIA have uh, something called a warp size, which contains 32 threads. AMD have something that they call a wave front, don't know why, uh, that has 64 threads. What we're going to do is using my previous example, okay, so this is my wallet from 2017, of course not my wallet, I mean, go nuts on it, there's nothing in there. <laughs> we're going to use a GeForce RTX 2080, okay, so modern card. And we're going to plug, we're going to work the numbers. So from the previous example, N was 1024, R was 8. So plugging in the maths, we have a one megabyte requirement to spawn a single computation. 32 for an NVIDIA card, 68 stream, stream multiprocessors, these are the compute units for NVIDIA. We need to spawn 2,176 computations, which means we need a graphics card that's 2,176 megs, two gigs, just over. Fortunately, those are 11 gig cards, so we're, we're good. However, here's a wallet, an Ethereum wallet I created in March this year. Look at that end parameter. That looks a little scarier, doesn't it? And it is, when you work it out, that's 128 megs per single computation, resulting in a 272 gig of RAM per GPU requirement. Again, <laughs> those cards are not 272 gigs in RAM. So you are likely going to see blue screens, errors, hangs, a world of pain and suffering. But that's where CPU comes to the rescue. Hooray, okay? So we can still always crack on our CPU, and that formed the basis of a follow-up post I did last year. Um, where you can take your Ethereum wallet, and assuming your parameters mean you can't GPU crack, you can select dash D1, which is device type 1, and then depending on how many CPUs you have or which CPU you would like to specify, dash lowercase d and your device ID. You can, you can see all your hardware information by doing a hash cat dash uppercase I from the command line. Okay? And then, here's the result. Um, oh, also, yes, yeah, sorry, to actually get your hash, ethereum to john.py. It comes with um, bleeding John Jumbo. So it doesn't come, actually come part with Hashcat, but the Ethereum to John PY, you do Ethereum to John, give it your wallet file, and it will create out a nice string, like as shown here in between the quotes. Call Hashcat, 15700, there's my, there's my uh, hash, gonna give it rock you, one rule to rule them all in this case, very importantly specifying CPU cracking at the end, okay? You'll see it skip the graphics cards, and this is done on MacBook Pro, nothing sexy about this. Macs are horrible for password cracking. Don't be fooled by the AMD cards in there, they're, they're horrible. You, you want NVIDIA all the way. Um, and lots of cooling, and lots of money to spend on electricity. There's the CPU. Anyone want to have a guess? How many, how many billions a second are we going to get on CPU? More, th more than a million? Who thinks more than 100,000? More than 100. <laughs> well, I can tell you, we're actually at 25 hashes a second, okay? So, yeah, maybe your great, 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 great grandchildren will be around to see it crack, who knows? This is based on a MacBook Pro. Of course, that time will be reduced if you've got some money to throw at a rig. But, uh, and of course, I mean, my rules are, there's, there's a lot of rules in my rule set, and you could use a tiny dictionary. The point I'm trying to make is, in this example, in Ethereum wallets, you really need to remember your password. If you don't, and it's not a really, easy, basic one that's going to form part of a normal dictionary, you might struggle. Okay, and the last part, because I'm really conscious of time now, um, non-ASCII characters, okay, so foreign password cracking. Normal and extended char ASCII character sets comprise 256. We've seen the 95 principle, okay? However, when we want to go and crack characters beyond that, we need to look outside ASCII, we need to look at using UTF-8, which uses between one and four bytes, okay? So in our example over here, here's British letters, um, Latin, sorry, letters A, B, and C, which is hex 4, 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3. One byte, fantastic. Just two example, some Greek letters here use two bytes, C, E, 92, C, E, 93, so on and so forth, okay? So we have to then, when attacking these, fuzz multiple positions just to get one character. Hashcat can do that with hex char set. It does it, does it quite nicely, okay? So I've got one more very, very quick video to show you. Um, and it's uh, an, Ara an Arabic alphabet crack, okay? So if you go to, I mean, I've just used this site here, but if you look down the Arabic, um, the lettering scheme, they all use two bytes of hex. The first byte is only one of these four. The second byte could be any of these, okay? But that comprises the character set we need. So let's, do, let's, let's work it out. Hashcat, it's an MD5 hash. Here's our hash value. We're gonna create two custom character sets I've shown earlier. The first one containing just our first byte hex, which you can pass without spaces. The second custom character set 
containing all of this concatenated together. Make sure we tell Hashcat it's going to be a, a, hex, a hex character crack. And then we need to fuzz our positions. But bear in mind, for every one Arabic character, we're going to need to do a one and a two because of the two hex bytes. Okay? So those 10 places will actually only crack a five character Arabic word in this particular case. And what we've got here is the, that exact command. And we're going to run through. We've got a few graphics cards in this rig, admittedly. <laughs> this, is the one, this is one of the ones we use for work. And cracked. And you can see it's taking Arabic characters. It's, in, it's outputting the Arabic alphabet to your screen. And there you go. You've just cracked the password. And if you've got this far, you know, you're doing well. Well done, literally. OK. <laughs> so the last slide. Secure yourself. We've all heard this kind of stuff before, but you know, best foot forward. It's all defense in depth. No one is immune. It's all about putting as much protection in front of you to make sure the hackers get bored and move on to someone else. Password managers. I use LastPass. One password is highly pushed. It's, it's a really, really good one. Um, if you've heard of Troy Hunt, he highly promotes it. There's Dashlane, KeyPass, many others. Pass phrases. Yeah, recommend five plus random words. Not just because I've shown you possible ways to attack four character passwords, but you know, there are lots of people out there who have much more hardware than me and lots of smarter people who know a lot more about password cracking than me. And if I know what I know, I dread to think what they know. So five random words is, is kind of good. Use spaces. Spaces are an accepted ASCII character. They don't affect the hash block. Windows accepts spaces. If you're on a badly coded application that says you can't use spaces, well, I don't even want to use that application, quite frankly, but use them, OK? Avoid all elements of knowledge-based auth. Don't use five words, but don't make it your mother's maiden name, your first dog, your first car. You know, let's be clever about this. Goes without saying, we all know what multi-factor auth is nowadays. Don't reuse passwords, OK? That's how people get caught in things, they reuse their passwords between banks, between emails, between, you know, we know this stuff. And if anyone's heard of Have I Been Pwned, run by Troy Hunt, please, it's really, really good, can't promote this enough. You can go to it, you can just put your email address in, and based on the security breach data he's been given, if your email address is in there, he'll tell you you've been hacked is the wrong word, but potentially your data has been floated online. So, you know, change your password. There's a notify me section, put your email addresses in there and you'll get an email if you're caught in future hacks. So, three minutes over, I think. Thank you very much, guys. Um, last thing to say is, last year, um, my company, I pushed out a password cracking CTF. Have a crack, pun fully intended, at the challenge. None of the challenges in there require prints and purple rain and that kind of stuff, but it does require lots of different attacks. Um, it was set up with, actually, we had $100 of ETH in a wallet as the prize, and the winner, the final password, unlocked the wallet, and they took the money. I think, remembering on Twitter, it took four and a half hours for some guy to get, but the, <laughs> the, the challenge is still there. Go nuts with it, have some fun. Um, and yeah, and obviously I'll, I'll take any questions, but I appreciate we're, we're, sh we're short on time, so um, speak to anyone offline as well. But thank you very much.